Please welcome Thomas. My name is Tomasz, I'm from Krakow. I'm a pani Majo Poruski, not much. I'm not a Karawaj Poruski, but I'm very good. That would be like most of my Russian. I, I also can count, so if you want to see me stammer, ask me to count like 200 something. That will be like my limit. Uh, usually I work for this company. Oh, wait. Okay, so I work for this company here, or this company here, uh, with those two people, Jarek and Jakub. Today I have the pleasure to actually entertain you with uh, some of my knowledge regarding JVM tuning. So let me first ask you, who here actually ever tuned JVM before? Not many hands, but a number. That's a good start. So. That's also good for me because most of the knowledge that I will be showing here today uh, is not really truly advanced realm or whatever, okay? So let's get on. I got infected in childhood. My parents were programmers. Uh, since they were programmers, it was actually quite natural for me to also become a programmer. Uh, my sister was a smart kid. She chose journalism. Sometimes I, en I envy her. Uh, I started with Amstrad and uh, Polish uh, machine called Elvro Junior, which was really nice machine for the time. Uh, I started in IT with ETL, web crawlers, then I moved through uh, web applications. I had an episode with JRuby, and I did various things of which I'm not so very proud of. Uh, I actually started tuning JVM since, uh, since Java 4. That was, we have much more tools back then. Uh, sorry, we have much less tools back then. Now, my current gig is for EPAM. It's Java Academy. And uh, I'm telling you about it because uh, if you have uh, any ideas how to actually tell totally new people how to become good programmers, I'm willing to listen because I'm now doing it. And I'm actually willing to listen to any, any possible ideas you, might gu you guys might have. So. Uh, what I actually do is I try to teach them thinking, problem solving, and uh, yeah, I have like three months to turn them into programmers, and very often they don't know how to program at all. I can be found on various social sites. I have a Twitter, I have a blog, I have a LinkedIn, and various others. And you may reach me after the presentation because I'll be here, so don't hesitate to ask any questions. Uh, also, please come to Geekon. We're doing the reactive Geekon in Sopot, Tri-City. So not far from here. It's Gdynia, Gdańsk, Sopot, and it will be uh, around reactive teams. So we, we, I think, may promise you really good speakers, and we will try to repeat the formula we actually did with previous Sopot edition, aka no bullshit, no hype. We'll try to actually get people who do things, and we'll try to tell them uh, real stories without just hyping you that reactive is the future and it's the only technology you should actually be studying right now So first you will learn a few things about when you approach uh, When you approach JVM tuning the number one item is to cool down yourself Because if you're not calm you will make mistakes if you'll make mistakes you'll make things worse uh, the whole presentation today is from a perspective when you're rushing, okay? Because usually it's like that. Usually everybody is called upon to save the day when the production hits rock bottom and can't get any lower. It's very slow, it's burning, and everybody's like, why didn't you think of performance like half a year ago? And you're like, because I was busy doing new features you told me to do. And this is the perspective with which we'll actually go through this presentation. So. There is much more to performance than just the JVM. So if your systems run on JVM, I'll also, on a number of occasions, skirt to, for example, underlying operating system or to your application, to some algorithm, things like that. There will be mention of this. However, mostly JVM. Uh, finally, 
you want to be warned before the crisis happens, okay? So you want to have monitoring, because if you don't have monitoring, that's the takeaway number one. If you do not have monitoring, install it, get it, okay? First point to remember and bring home from this presentation, you want your application to be monitored constantly. Onwards. So, everybody's kung fu fighting must be fast like lightning, and you're called upon whatever you were doing, you must drop it, and now you're saving the day. Sounds familiar? Everybody ever been in this situation? Hands up. Number of hands. I think it's close to everybody who actually raised their hands when they said, yes, I was JVM tuning. That was my first time. Okay, my production slowed down, and all of a sudden my boss came and said, you know, this ultra important feature I told you to focus on, forget it. You must save production. Yeah. And I was like, but you know that I never touched production. Yeah, I know. But the other programmers are busy on vacation or sick. You're the, you're the one left. And I was like, okay, so how much time do I have? Like, you start now. Cool. Like the best way to start. Uh, and when this happens, you probably know completely nothing about performance. As at least I did it. So what I started doing was what I thought was right. Uh, I never can say this if we have a straight face, but that was like worst chain of decisions ever in performance. So to make you not repeat my mistakes will be going through what you should know. First of all, you need to know your traffic and you need to know your application and you need to know your infrastructure. These are three main points you need to know if you want to tune performance. If you want to save your application, you need to know what may kill it, okay? You need to know your limits. So, hands up who can say uh, where you have a peak hour. Peak hour is where your traffic is like the largest. Everybody logs in. Hands up who can say. And those of you who didn't raise their hands, that's your first homework. Find out your peak hour. So your peak hour is probably when most of your customers can log into your systems. So if you happen to have American customers and European customers, you're in for a very special treat. You have double peak hour. Because between our time here in Minsk, uh, like, 14 to 16, Europeans are still working. And those then Americans, they woke up, came to work, and they start working. So all of a sudden, everybody from Europe can access your application, and everybody from States can also access your application. Double the traffic, double the excitement. So once you know your peak hours, you can actually think whether you, the traffic may actually kill your application. And that is question number two. What traffic kills your application? Okay, so can your application handle five concurrent users a second? And 10 concurrent users? And 100 concurrent users? What if your customer suddenly does this? Welcome, come and use our services on Friday at noon. If you do, you will get a gift card. And everybody comes, because they want that gift card. And your customer, in their splendid marketing scheme, they forgot of one tiny issue, to inform you. So all of a sudden, Friday noon, you get this spike in traffic. What the heck? Oh my god, I know, I'm being attacked. It's a DDoS attack. And frankly, it is by your own customer. So this is number two. You need to know your traffic because then you will be able to actually tell whether you're being DDoS attacked, and if so, from which IP. Oh, these are customers' IP. Never mind, ban them. So know your traffic, know your application. Finally, know your infrastructure. Know your infrastructure is about not just being able to say, oh, I'm on JVM 7. That's way too little. So version of JVM, which updates you've already installed, what is the machine you're running on, what is your virtualization, what is your operating system and file system that you have on this operating system, whether your operating system actually uses uh, the NOAA time or not, things like that matter for a number of applications. 
So a lot to learn. Only then you need to know the recent changes. Like for example, the production people are coming to you and they are telling, after we actually went online with new application, it's very, very slow. What do you think happened? And then the unspeaking elephant in the room is this. You are the developer. You've made changes. And now the application is slow. Do you see the logic, you stupid developer? It's your code. It's not my infrastructure. And very often it looks like this. And uh, we hear it, even though they do not speak of it out loud. And then it's like, OK, so it's my code. So I'm getting all defensive. No, it may not be my code because, and I'm listing all the reasons. Half of them is good, half of them is pure marketing, the other half is complete bullshit. You follow my mathematics? Excellent, I knew you were intelligent. So now, you, know, you need to know recent changes, but not like, oh, I know like because I've created uh, the release log. So I can tell we fixed 11 bugs. How can fixing the bugs make applications slower? No, to know recent changes is to know the impact. So this is the point where I'm telling you about performance tests. Performance tests are actually quite easy when you have JVM machines because we have a very nice library called Gatling. And Gatling, despite being written in Scala, or because it's written in Scala, now I'm trying to judge whether this audience prefers because or the other version. OK, let's go with because. Uh, so because it's written in Scala, it's actually fairly nice to use. You get your performance scenario as a Scala code. And thus, you may quite easily version it in version control or change it to your liking. Then your limits. Some of them come from point one. Okay, your traffic, your application, your infra infrastructure, these are your limits. But your limits may also be when you share infrastructure. Because, for example, when one of your servers is being used by your application and by this other application, then you need to know that this server has a much lower limit than other servers. To have access to monitoring. I don't know who here has actually a DevOps on your team, like a team member. He participates in daily stand-ups, things like that. Hands up if you do. Wow. Those three or four hands who actually went up very shakily, I totally envy you guys. Really treasure that DevOps person. You want him. You want him around. So the other people, uh, you're unfortunately the vast majority. What can you do? So. Talk to your DevOps people or your sysadmins or whoever is at actually doing things on your infrastructure and ask them for read-only access. Just that. Read-only access. Nothing about reading from database, nothing like that. Just tell them you would like to see the monitoring with just read-only, no changes. This is something they probably will agree on. So once they do, you will be able to take a look yourself how this application actually behaves. You will know where the problems may be. Then you may actually take a look and adjust pooling because connection pooling and thread pooling are fairly important, both of them. We'll talk about them later. Finally, you will be able to peruse logs. Uh, who here has uh, Elk under production? Wow. Who here knows what ELK is? Hands up. OK, then small digression. Uh, ELK is Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. These three tools by Elastic, well, two of them by Elastic at least, are actually very good tool to take a look at your logs and only take out of them what you're after. So for example, uh, create yourself a dashboard and you will be able to quickly see how many errors your application is throwing on a daily basis, where those errors belong to which modules, and you will also be able to pull out, well, practically everything out of it with little effort on your side, okay? To set up Elk for pretty much any pipeline, it never took me more than four hours, okay? And once you've actually learned uh, the Grok, the Logstash language for transforming the log files, it's even faster. 
So one time effort of like half a day, let's say even a day, and you have a pipeline, automated one, that takes your log and turns them into graphical displays, which is pure awesome. And only once those are done, you're, we're actually down to tuning the JVM itself. Okay? So being a dev, I really want this laser pointer to work. But, well, no luck. So being a developer, you will need actually a number of things. Oh, wait. I may have my own clicker. Let's see if I lied. No, I didn't. Ha <laughs> ha. And now I'll change them, and neither of them will work if math is low or anything to believe. Yeah? You see the pointer? Excellent. Excellent. It works. Mafi, I beat you this one time. Don't take offense. So, uh, what's a JVM? There are, number, there are a number of JVMs on the market. Today, I'll focus on Sun and now Oracle Hotspot. What is a JVM is actually being validated by a set of technical compliance kit. This is the number of tests that Oracle has at their disposal. If you actually have written your own JVM implementation, you may submit this. Uh, you may submit to Oracle a wish, a request that you want actually this JVM implementation to be validated. And if you pay the money, you will get the tests and you will be able to use them to see what you're missing to be a true JVM. Now, Sun Hotspot, which version? and which architecture. These are two things you'll need to know about your JVM applications to know how to tune them properly. So JVM tuning is usually assigned or actually uh, associated, sorry, uh, it's associated with adjusting GC based on logs. So my first question is, who here logs garbage collection? Way too few hands. Who here has JVM apps? and works on them. OK, the remaining people, what are you working on? <laughs> Some shouts? You're not working, you're students. <laughs> you should ask? <laughs> ah, OK. I actually half understood, but I'll pretend I'll, I'm smart, yeah? So, uh, the next item. To adjust heap, to tweak starting flux, and to use tools. We'll cover them all today. So, JVM tuning, performance problem diagnostic, diagnostic tools all in a rush. JVM tuning them. First of all, it is a process. Okay? JVM is a process on your machine. What this means is that it is governed by the same exact rules that pretty much every other program you're running on this machine. So it must fight for resources. It may be killed by your operating system, because why not? And it may run out of resources. OS architecture enforces JVM architecture which is 32-bit machine means 32-bit JVM and 64 and so on. Your memory is limited by your operating system. You have heap and you have C heap. Do you know what a C heap is? The remaining RAM, okay? So if you have four gigabytes of RAM and you start your JVM with two, then the remaining two usually will be C heaps. It's not that simple. I'm actually simplifying it a great deal here, but for now, let's work with that. IOWISE and threadwise, you're limited by open file descriptors, okay? So if you're running on uh, Linux distribution, on Unix systems, then you will be able to open only uh, 1024 descriptors by default. If you want to change that, you will need to change the setting for the user that runs your JVM applications, okay? Out of memory flavors, who knows some? Shout. You, you probably have it right. Oh, they are so charmingly shy. OK. I'll shout, I'll shout it for you. 
So out of heap space is one of the basic ones. This is one, this is one probably everyone knows and associates with just out of memory error. Excellent. This is the other one, the permgen error. And final, out of three most popular, is unable to create native thread. Okay? So what is interesting is there are others which are less popular and less often existing, but they may actually get at you. And if you ever took a look at the API for out of memory error, this is what it says, okay? That JVM cannot allocate an object because it is out of memory, and no more memory could be made available by the garbage collector. So out of memory, if we trust the Java docs, is thrown when GC went and failed to actually create us more space or find us more space. In actuality, out of memory error is thrown when you've run out of open file descriptors, unable to create native thread. You want to create a new thread. The thread wants to allocate memory. The thread cannot allocate memory because the thread in Java is linked to thread in operating system. The thread in operating system needs an open file descriptor. At least that is true for Unix system. I'm not speaking of Windows here because I, don't, I simply don't know them good enough to speak about them. So if you have any server running on Linux Unix machine, your native thread needs to have an open file descriptor. By default, you have like 1,024 of them if you haven't changed the setting on the system. Out of memory, due to failure in allocating GC, nothing about friends, nothing about permgen, nothing about three other reasons that you may have. And how do you learn about them? Uh, you learn about them purely by experience or uh, by reading rather obscure documentation on Oracle site. Try Googling for types or flavors of out of memory uh, error, and you will find them. So how much memory JVM uses if we started with default settings like that? XMX is XMS is one gigabyte. How much memory the JVM will now use? Sorry? 25% of the available RAM. Why? It is, but we actually used XMX and XMS. It's a good answer if we started without any parameters, but if we started with those parameters, XMX being one gigabyte, XMS being one gigabyte. One gigabyte, okay. Any other answer? Louder. Good, good one. Plus permgen. That's actually very important because XMX is setting the heap. Uh, the permgen is not really fully part of the heap despite garbage collection being, being on it. Uh, there is even more. There is a reserved space for JVM reallocation or for actually garbage collections uh, region settings. And also, you have thread space. Okay? So. If this is entire RAM, and we actually set XMX like this, this is C heap, okay? Now over here, we have operating system itself, because it also needs RAM, any other program that we're running on this machine, be it for operating system sake or for our sake, or say we may have even three JVMs here. Why not, okay? And then we also have threads, okay? So in the C heap, threads are allocating their own memory. So whenever you're creating a thread, you're using actually by default eight kilobyte of C heap. Thus, you may tune your garbage collection to the extreme and your threads may still kill you because they're out of memory. Now, why both XMS and XMX are so often set to the same value? Any ideas? If you have less memory, uh, you may want to avoid readjusting. Okay? XMS is the minimal heap space, or rather, I should point, I should correct this word, it's the initial heap space. XMX is the maximal heap space. So the initial size is what the JVM is getting when it starts. 
once you use that to some extent, like 70% of it is used, then JVM goes to operating system and it says, hey, please give me more memory. And the operating system usually will say, okay. Then JVM starts expanding the heap. Previous, of course, to that happening, garbage collection is triggered because perhaps if we garbage collect what we already have, we don't need to go to operating system and ask for more memory. So once that fails, and we turn out that even with garbage collection, we can't actually allocate the object, then instead of throwing out of memory error, we go to operating system and we say, hey, give me more memory. And then we need to expand the heap, which is not a simple process, okay? So we end up with memory being assigned in blocks, and we end up with heap moving across it. So for a number of years and in a number of cases, it's actually much simpler to set both those parameters to same value. To have this set once and for all, and actually do not play with any readjustments. Now, the cool thing about that is that when you have like three or four JVMs running, you will notice that your memory footprint of those JVMs will be larger and smaller. For example, in the morning, when your customers haven't yet fully logged in, you probably don't need all the RAM that you need when you have a peak hour. So if you have XMX and SMS set to the same value, the JVM cannot shrink, okay? It cannot lessen itself. It cannot make its memory footprint smaller. But if you set them to different values, it may. So there are cases when you want to set those values to different, uh, to different uh, say, figures. So we have operational space for JVMs. We have PermGen, a nice point there, and we have J JVM heap. In Java 8, PermGen is replaced with Metaspace, but the rules are pretty much the same. Okay, what is PermGen? It's a permanent generation. Uh, who here knows the generational hypothesis? Not many, so I'll briefly explain. Uh, why they came up with garbage collection? Because they noticed, they did extensive studies on several code bases, and they noticed that when you create an object, when you create a variable, it actually has two possible scenarios. It will either die very soon, like it will stop being used and needed, or it will live for a very long time. So they decided that they can actually divide the space, the memory space that program is using, into the nursery, where the infants go, and the tenured generation, where the seniors go. So those objects who actually live very long, they land in nursery, the other guys are landing in the Aden. Back then, uh, having permanent generation was a good idea because it was for Java classes, okay? Nobody actually played with Java classes. Once they, once they were loaded, they stayed. So they decided they by day, I mean hotspot people back then from Oracle, from Sun, they decided that they will create a permanent generation, a next region outside of the heap, which will not be garbage collected, collected as often. And they will put Java classes in there, and they will put intern strings in there, which worked excellently back in Java 1.3. Java 1.4 introduced reflection, and things went slightly haywire from there because all of a sudden we, could, we, have, we had tools to manipulate Java classes, and, it, and we did. So in Java 6, uh, they decided that PermGen must go. In Java 7, they removed the strings from PermGen. In Java 8, they removed PermGen at all. They replaced it with MetaCity. Now MetaCity holds other objects. It doesn't yet, uh, it doesn't hold the permanent generation, so this is how the concept guy died. The quick fix for the PermGen is to just increase the PermGen size and watch the application, okay? You need to watch it. Because if you have a PermGen leak, then if you just increase the PermGen, it will not save you. It will just prolong your suffering. Instead of like crashing after an hour, you will crash after two. Wow. So quick fix, increase PermGen size, and take a look at what's eating your PermGen for a more permanent fix. Uh, actually, when you hear quick fix here, it's never a good fix, okay? 
It's just something to make your production recover from the traffic, from the onslaught, from the problem. Okay? It's just something to get your boss off your back and to actually be able to work the real solution. Now, PMGen, Java heap, when GC runs. We already know that it runs when we want to actually expand or shrink JVM. This is item one. We know it runs before out of memory error gets thrown. Uh, any other ideas when GC will run? <laughs> it's non-deterministic. Uh, that's an nifty answer, actually. I, I heard uh, one of the uh, leaders in the field, Kirk Pepperdine, said something very similar. So you may suggest uh, when it runs, but usually there are a number of rules, and most likely you will not get them all. So you have two strategies. Try to prolong the working of your application the longest you can or try to have many short pauses. That's like your choice. Minor collection, major collection, and full collection. Uh, for the sake of today's presentation, let me explain the difference. Minor collection only runs in Eden. Major collection runs in Eden and survival spaces. Full collection is like entire heap. Number of times you will notice that major collection actually triggers the full collection. So once we go through Eden Survivor, uh, we notice that actually we need to do it all, so we do the full collection anyway. Every single collection pauses. Okay? Your application will be stopped entirely once a collection is triggered, even the minor one. Because garbage collection cannot afford your application changing the state on the heap. So your application will be completely and utterly stopped. Now, for the sake of today, I'll talk of major collections as if they were full collections, okay? Then let's move on. Infants when die quickly, tenured where long-lived people go. So we divided heap like that, and here we allocate new objects, and here most of our garbage collection runs should be limited to, okay? You don't want your garbage collection to traverse entire heap because that's usually way too large of a, of a heap, okay? Even if you have like two gigabytes or four gigabytes, it's in number of cases, this is too large of a pause. Eden has also two survival spaces to handle locality, and you may actually navigate them through JVM flags. We will not be covering this today because it's way too large topic. There are like, there is 120 flags uh, that deal with uh, GC, okay? And number of them deal with uh, various GC algorithm, and around of 60 of them will actually change the output of your GC logs. So way too much material for our presentation. However, uh, with survivor spaces, you can handle locality. With survivor spaces, you can actually uh, adjust how many times you will have a major collection, and you may lessen the chances of major collection triggering full collection. So, fairly important concept. Uh, what else? I said that you will need to balance and make decisions. So the traders are as follows. You may either change, uh, you may either choose that your application will work for a long period of time without any GC pause. And once you actually survive that, that period, GC pause may happen and may stop everything because now you don't care. This is good strategy, for example, if your customers are in one time zone. Okay? So you choose the moment when they are already locked off, and then GC pause can happen. It may last hour. You don't care. Nobody will see it. So this is one strategy. The other strategy is to have many, many minor collections happening only in Eden and suffer through it. Okay? You will have many but really short pauses. And in some cases, this is a better strategy. Now, when you need to choose which? So this depends on what your application is doing. So one of the first questions when you are to tune GC is, what is my application actually doing? What kind of application do I have? Okay? Is it uh, 
large throughput or is it actually long period of intermittent operation where user perhaps is doing something and perhaps it's not? Okay? If your users are constantly doing something but they may survive like two microseconds of a break, then yeah, you know what your application is doing. You know that you want many minor collections. Okay? You want your objects to be short-lived. You want many short-lived objects. You want your Eden to be filled and you, are, you want the promotion to senior being set rather high. Okay? When, on the other hand, your application uh, will use long-lived objects a lot and it will, for example, for some time uh, launch into a period of intense activity which cannot be interrupted under any circumstances, then you want a large period of time where garbage collection stays dormant inactive. And then when the break happens, you hope that everybody already went home. Uh, why is the break such a terrible thing? Well, I told you that it stops your entire application, but depending on the size of your heap, it may last seconds or minutes or even hour. Okay? So when the break happens, you will not be able to use the application and your users will see it as application hanging, crushing, being totally non-responsive. So what they'll do is probably the F5 syndrome. Refresh, refresh, refresh. Damn it, why isn't it working? Refresh more. And all of a sudden, because of your backend being not responsive, your frontend will be utterly swamped. Okay? Now then, uh, we've mentioned that it will be adjusting GC based on logs. We've mentioned that it will be adjusting native heap. Uh, we, covered, uh, we covered two flags which will help you. And yeah, let's move on to logging GC because I haven't yet talk, talked enough about it. There are like five crucial flags that you want to do. First of all X, is X log GC flag, okay? Excellent. Once we have discovered, let me actually go to, oh uh, yeah, nope, wait a second, this one, no, it was downloads. Okay, I have here a jar, okay? Let me now run it uh, with the flag that I'm after. So it would be log gc, gc.log. Okay. The application is fairly basic. It's one of the demos for Java 8 showing what can you do with new graphics. Let me actually make it kill itself because I've started it with very draconian setting, okay? The entire heap is to actually fill in 20 megabytes. I've also started this with this flag, okay? Now we can do This is your garbage collection working. A speedy guy, isn't he? He collects and collects and collects and collects and collects, okay? So this is why setting your heap right is very important. Because right now I've set it wrong and we see that pretty much most of the time the application spent is in garbage collection, okay? Now, uh, let me change the flux slightly, okay? Let me kill the application and let me kill this flag, okay? No GC details, just pure logging. Let me go to transforms, let me make sure that we really will crash and burn. Decrease delay, more animation, more animation. Now let me repeat the tale, okay? Less information. 
now I can see the timestamp, I can see the kind of GC, I can see the allocation failure, and I can see from how much to how much we went and how much we spent, okay? So as you can see now, I have little but small pauses. If you see here a full GC instead of GC, you have reasons to worry, okay? Minor GCs are not that bad. Full GCs are very bad. Okay. Now then, let's go back and add the other flag. Uh, print tenuring distribution. Uh -huh, and Oh wait, the previous flag was slightly different. Sorry, it was details, right? Yeah, it was details. Let's kill it. Okay. Now we can see the type of algorithm that was used. Uh, we can see how the algorithm actually went, and we can see times in user space system space and the real one. So you want to actually take a look at various flags and you want to introduce that on your production systems. Because when the production will hit rock bottom without collecting information, you will not be able to tell whether your application behaved any different at all than it behaves usually. Okay? If you do not know how your garbage collection statistics look like on a normal average day where nothing bad happens, you can't say when the crisis come how serious the situation is and whether your garbage collection is any different than normal. Okay? So please log garbage collection. DC tuning is a trade-off. So do select your strategy. Before you start actually changing anything, be aware what kind of application are you tuning, what this application really demands. No pauses or very short pauses, OK? The short primer on GC ended off to diagnosing performance problems, AKA what hit me, what causes me to die. So. These two people are Heinz Kabutz on my left and Kirk Pepperdine on my, on my right. These are two very good Java specialists. Both are actually quite into performance. Uh, Pepperdine actually created his own company and he uh, also created, uh, uh, he also wrote, has written a tool that actually takes a look at garbage collection logs and visualizes them, okay? Now, they have this methodology called the box. So first you take a look at the traffic. Is your traffic anything different than usual? If it's different than usual, how different is it? Then you take a look at uh, people and integrations, okay? I had a case where uh, my system was killed because a contractor actually used wrong con stop condition in a for loop, sorry, in a while loop. So he was knocking at my door 10,000 a second. And this killed me, okay? So back then I learned that you cannot always trust the system you're integrating with. They can kill you as well as your users. So the traffic. Then you, okay, then you take a look at the code, okay? The application code. You're moving one level down. And here what is important is algorithm and data structures, okay? Because if you use the wrong data structure, you're signing your own death warrant. If you use wrong algorithm that actually does way too much operations, you're asking for trouble. So choose your algorithm, choose your data structures very, very carefully. If you're not certain whether they are the best, take time to measure. Then, you actually can take a look at other things like, for example, uh, threads or connections. 
Then we go to JVM when it's Flux and GC. Then we have operating system where we have uh, U limit, which is how many open processes we can have, how many open files files can we have, and so on. Uh, config architecture, then virtualization, which is like another topic entirely, and so on. Brandon Gregg proposed a very good uh, methodology for this. It's called USE. Utilization, saturation, and errors. Okay? How it works. You create a resource and you create a checklist for that resource. Like, what can I do to check out how much my front-end server is utilized? How heavy is the workload? Then, how many people are waiting to use it? And then, what errors is it actually throwing out? Once you have those three simple measures in place, in any moment you can actually execute those measures. You get three numbers or conditions or whatever, and you can tell whether your front end server is in trouble or not. And similarly to pretty much everything in your pipeline, you want to know the performance of it. Now, uh, the box, and if it comes to GNU Linux performance, Brandon Gregg. This guy is actually totally amazing. Okay, uh, he's in the performance field for like 20 years now. He wrote a couple of books. He works for Netflix, so really large scale. And yeah, his website is actually a goldmine of good information. Tools. As I told you, GNU Linux surely has a tool for that, and here you have it. System call interface, S-trace, libraries. I don't know which libraries is being called. L-trace tells you. Netstat to debug sockets, TCP package, UDB packages, uh, whether IP frames are, correct, are created correctly, whether the Ethernet is behaving as it should. If you want to take a look at profilers, here you have them. Okay? Uh, depending on your system, on your preferences, you will find uh, ones better than the others. When you use the profilers, keep in mind that they are intensely heavy. Okay? They add number of steps that your application usually doesn't do. Threat with curve. Uh, you may take a look at how scheduler is behaving, how me virtual memory is beha behaving, whether your drivers are uh, OK or not, for example, by taking a look at the IO bus, and so on and so on. There is a number of tools to look in number of corners and dark places in your operating system. Well, unless it's Windows, then sorry. One of the tools that can do a lot of that on its own is SAR. System Activity Reporter is actually a tool that takes a look in number of places day by day. So when you have a performance crisis, you may take a look at values that SAR collected like a week ago, a month ago, and you may simply compare. And you will see that throughout the latest month, my application is actually behaving in a stable manner, but for example, I can see that my disk performance is worsening day by day. So perhaps before I have a crisis, I'll do something about it. Okay? GNU Linux surely has a tool for that. How to find your Java process? So let's start our application one more time. Oh, damn it, I closed the window. I wasn't, oh, I didn't close the window. So let's start it. Okay, now we know for certain that we have a Java process running. How can we find the PID? So the number one solution people usually do is PX with grep, okay? Which displays you quite an output and yeah, good luck finding your own, right? So there is other solution, okay? slightly better. You may have the lengthier version. Wow, Java, Java, Java. Mm. And there is another solution called JPS. Okay, and here we have some differences. JPS is a tool that JDK offers since like version 6. So if you have JDK 6, you may check the PID with this tool. Now what is even more interesting is that JPS registers itself as a tool. Now take a look at one more thing. Mm. This is the directory with your own username that you want to actually take a look at, okay? 17929 here, 
18093 here, 50020 here, okay? So when your Java process starts, it registers itself in a temp hsperf data or any other IO temp dir directory, okay? There is a variable, environmental variable, which is called IO temp dir. If you change that or if you take in yourself the access to this directory, you will not be able to use JPS. JInfo is a tool that allows you to actually change flags on the fly. There are two kinds of JVM flags. There are manageable flags and unmanageable flags. Manageable flags can be changed without restarting your JVM, okay? So you will be able to actually change the value without bringing down and up the application. Uh, dumping threads can be done with kill or with JSTAC. Kill may be intercepted. If you have embedded JVM, kill probably is intercepted by whatever is embedding the JVM. It will be turned off. There is a flag which may actually cause your JVM not to respond to kill minus three. So you will not see the thread dump. But if you use JSTAC, you will. JHAT allows you to take a look at your heap and there is JVisual VM. Let me run it. There are three plugins in JVisual VM that you probably want to, inst to install. One is OQL syntax support, the other is Threads Inspector, and the third is uh, GC Visualizer. Okay? I'll show you the latter one. And Visual GC. Okay. Here you can take a look at how actually you look generally. Meta space, survival spaces, uh, you may see Eden and you may see uh, the tenured, okay, the old gen. You can see the statistics, how it looks like. Every GC drawing that you want to have is a saw. Growth, collection. Gross collection. This is a good GC, okay? It behaves as it should. Unless it's a full GC, then you're in trouble. So, you will be rushed to save production, so prepare in advance. Have monitoring, collect the data before the crisis happens. Uh, log GC, because you really need it. Rotate the lock on a daily basis. There is a flag for that. JVM is a process. Set it up accordingly to your needs. Make sure that it can open as many file descriptors as it actually desires and needs. Then remember the box. Remember use from Brandon Gregg. And remember that GNU Linux actually, when it comes to tool, is totally unparalleled. And I'm open to questions. Thank you very much. Questions? Sorry, it was loud. Yep. Uh, thank you for first of all. And the uh, question is about monitoring tool. Have you tried any proprietary ones? Like Dynatrace, AppDynamics, Relic, whatever? Dynatrace is good. They're actually catching up to AppDynamics. AppDynamics so far is like the king in the domain. Uh, if you cannot afford the money, because both are commercial, uh, there is, uh, I don't know the prices between New Relic and AppDynamic. New Relic is excellent if you have a web app. Still, all those tools have two drawbacks. One, commercial, meaning you pay money. The other, cloud. You send them data about their application. Some banks, some financial institution, they'll like kill you on the spot if you do that. So what you can do is, A, have private cloud and set them up like that, but not every tool will agree to that. Dynatrace, for, Dynatrace I think, will not agree, but I may be wrong here. 
uh, and the alternative is open source tool called uh, Java Melody. Okay, uh, it's actually fairly good and it allows you to get a lot. One more alternative would be if you actually became Elk Master, Elasticsearch Log Search Kibana, then you can set up the pipeline and you can collect various information because you can actually collect uh, OS logs and feed it to Elastic. You can collect your application logs. You can collect GC logs. And all of that can be interpreted during dashboards. It's by hand solution, so a lot of your time. But if you cannot have anything else, I would go that way. Oh, the shy person. Give him the microphone. I want to hear his voice. OK. Just unfortunately, this is will be the last question. A uh, question about maybe you have it, had a chance to meet the edge, Azure the GVM. Uh, nope. Actually, no. I've heard of it, but haven't. Uh... Oh, wait. OK. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yes, the Zinc. Zinc is actually excellent uh, to uh, the point that yeah, when you, see when you saw the output of PS, these were like all the command line arguments for the JVMs, okay? That is why the PS output was so long. And in Zinc, it's like there is one parameter instead of all that, because the Zinc has only one garbage collection algorithm, and it's like the best there is. So I had the pleasure uh, of seeing Zinc in action. I haven't had the pleasure of working on it commercially. It was just uh, an open source project, and uh, I liked what I saw. Thank you. So if you have the option, uh, if your performance is really, really weak, and uh, you have a buttload of money, throw them at Zinc Corporation at Azul Systems, and buy their JVM and run on it. It will really help. Thank you again. Что ж, дамы и господа.